The business of operations management is difficult, particularly in large enterprises like banking, insurance, and other services companies with teams of hundreds and thousands around the globe. Now add in recent pandemic forcing the workplace to change forever. Managers and employees are under immense pressure to get work done, while also finding ways to balance performance and well-being. The complexity is building, and it can be difficult to find the answers. This podcast, AO On Air, partnered with ActiveOps, is designed to help identify areas that will help employees, managers, and senior leaders find solutions to the challenges within operations management. The future of work will take all departments, such as HR, IT, and ops, aligned along with a steady dose of innovation to succeed. We'll bring you topics, thought leadership, and simple plans to help lead your teams into the future of work. A hybrid work world that will learn from one another and truly act globally, breaking down the silos of older management models for new ways of working. Welcome to the journey. Now let's begin. All right. Welcome to AO On Air. My name is Michael Cups. I'm your host today. This is a podcast sponsored by ActiveOps. We have a real fun guest and a a topic today that everybody knows and everybody participates in because it's called customer service. Uh, So no doubt the pandemic changed the way that we react and we interact with our our, our vendors of choice, whether they be financial services or retailers, et cetera. Uh, and a lot changed, and they, and they accelerated the need for change as well. So today we're going to spend some time talking about that digital experience, that digital experience that could be a good experience, could be a bad experience, depending on how you how you approach it. Uh, there's there, there's good examples and bad examples. Bad examples are when they're trying to cover it up with marketing by maybe giving you a gift or a cookie or something when they when they don't finish the transaction. But t- to some, it's just finishing the transaction quickly and, and efficiently and getting on with their day. So. Uh, our guest today is, is I'm excited to have him. Rick DeLisi uh, is a co-author of The Effortless Experience. Rick was, uh, is also an analyst for Glia Software, which is a firm focused on reinventing customer service. Uh, previously, Rick was also at the research firm Gartner. So, w- Rick, welcome to, to, the, uh, to the podcast today. Why don't we start maybe with you telling a little bit about yourself and your experience with customer service. And also want to mention, before you get started, that we are going to talk about a new book that you're an author of that... Uh, uh, that we'll talk about at the, uh, in a few minutes in, during the podcast. Yeah, thanks for having me. Really glad to be here. And I've been studying customer service for the better part of the last two decades, and much more specifically, the psychology of service interactions. What happens with any person in the midst of a service interaction that changes the way they feel about that company and ultimately their future loyalty? So as much as we always talk about customer service, that's the input. The output is that person's future loyalty, and that's what's always at stake every time there's a service issue. Yeah, exactly. And and so your book, the the first book that we talked about, the effortless experience, uh, covers that. And you know, service that actually works is maybe what we want to call it. Uh, but could you tell us a little bit about what an effortless experience is for a co- consumer? Yeah, to give you a little background on the research, it started with a simple question, which is. What survey question could you ask a customer right after a service interaction that would best predict that person's future loyalty? And the standard questions in the customer service industry have been either the CSAT question, the customer satisfaction question, how satisfied were you with this interaction, or the NPS question, the net promoter score question, which is how likely are you to recommend us? And what we learned is That while certainly you would want customers to be satisfied and certainly you'd want them to recommend you, a customer's answer to either of those two questions isn't as predictive of their future loyalty as most companies would want or have been led to believe. But what we discovered is that a customer's answer to the question, how much effort was required for you to get your issue resolved, is a nearly perfect predictor of future loyalty. So then we began to explore the the art and science of creating effortless experiences for customers. What does that mean, both in terms of the mechanics of the interaction and more importantly, the psychology of the interaction that would have a person either saying, wow, that was a huge hassle to get my issue resolved, or much better, that was way easier than than I would have thought. And ultimately, that ought to be the goal of every service interaction for the customer after it was over to say, I thought that might be a big hassle. Turns out it wasn't. They solved my problem, and now I get to go on with the rest of my life. 
Yeah, yeah. So, so I guess with that in mind, I, I, you, when you do have those experiences, it is wonderful, and you do say that that was easy, <laughs> you know. So, why are so many custom or companies still getting this wrong? I mean, especially you know, being forced through, forced to be digital. What, why are why are they still messing this up? Well, there's a couple of reasons. One is a lot of companies strive for consistency in the way they serve customers, and and one of the things I've been learning is that as great as this phrase that I'm about to share with you sounds, it's actually the wrong direction and the wrong strategy. And that is, we want to create a consistently excellent experience for our customers. Yeah. So how could that possibly be wrong? Well, in reality, the execution of consistent excellence is almost always interpreted as we should do exactly the same thing with every customer every time. We have a process that we follow we guide customers through the experience in a very predictable and repeatable way. And that sounds great. But the reality is people are very different. Situations are very different. And even the attitude and psychology that a given customer has might be very different from one experience to another. So a customized, personalized experience that feels like it's all about me is really the definition of excellence. And when you think about it that way, you would have to then realize that excellent service is extremely inconsistent yeah. in that it's customized to the person and the situation that they're in. So this idea of trying to standardize service or trying to create consistency is, in fact, the exact wrong thing if you're trying to enhance a customer's future loyalty. That's number one. Number two is that in the age that we live in, where we are all glued to this thing all day, every day, where we're all heads down in our own digital bubble, yeah. way too much of customer service still happens on the telephone. And that is wrong for today's customers. And that's wrong for today's world. Yeah. Yeah. So when you talk about the the inconsistency is maybe the competitive advantage, we, we, we get that small retailers or small fintechs that are growing, startups that are growing, can kind of personalize that experience because they have to. It's a necessity to save cost and to win customers and keep customers. But the bigger companies seem to be lagging behind in that because is, is it because customers are just a churn number or is it because they just haven't caught up with the technology yet? Where, where do you see that they're, the laggards are coming from? Well, it really comes down to the fact that customer service is typically seen as a one-to-many consideration, you know. What's the average experience that our average customer is having? And, you know, when you're managing hundreds of people in a contact center operation and dealing with hundreds of thousands or millions of customer interactions, how could you look at it any way other than the big picture? But in reality, there's only two people who are involved in any service interaction, one customer and one company rep, and the interaction between those two people is the only thing that matters. That interaction times however many interactions you're having in a year, that's your whole service program. Yeah, that's interesting. And so trying to think about it big picture or based on averages or trying to achieve a certain threshold of NPS score or even a certain threshold of customer effort score isn't really the right approach because it's still very much a one-on-one -on -one consideration. Yeah, very good. That's good. That's good. I years ago I was was with a company that started kind of one to one personalization when e commerce was when websites and dot com weren't really set a whole lot. It was an interesting transition then as well. So so let me uh, let me just mention if you don't mind the whole the whole concept of personalization, I think has also been misinterpreted or overinterpreted perhaps. Really, what customers want is not an experience where you use my name three times or where it feels like you've customized the experience to me personally, but rather you've customized the experience to the situation I'm in. Yeah. So the preferences, the reaction to, and the amount of effort experienced by the same exact person might be very different depending on their exact needs or issue at the moment. And so what we're beginning to explore is what is the right combination of digital or virtual assistance and then live assistance that's right 
for each individual customer who's having the exact situation or experience they're having right now. Yeah. Yeah. So two questions on that top. One, is there a type of service industry or product that is best suited for this? Like, you know, is it small retail type things or is it bigger transaction types like mortgages or, or, or life insurance, which tends to stay with a person for, for, a, for decades, typically, uh, we hope anyway. Or, and then how do those, those companies get started on the journey? How do they get there to kind of improve? So the company I work for, Glia, specializes in providing digital customer service to financial institutions. So credit unions, banks, and insurance companies. Well, even within the realm of that vertical, those companies all have to deal with customers who are handling a wide variety of situations. Let's just take a credit union. Think about how different an interaction is when the customer's inquiry is, what's your routing number versus I want to apply for a loan or I'm going to do a much more complex financial interaction. It's the same customer. It's the same company. But the experience that would be right for each of those situations is wildly different one from another. So it's less about the industry and less about the individual, but much more about the range of issues or processes or outcomes that that person's trying to reach right now at this moment. And, and how would a company that's not doing well today, as, as we would consider on the digital uh, experience, where do they start? I mean, wh where, do you, where do you even begin? It starts by analyzing the top issue types that customers are contacting you about. And so let's just start with the top 10 list. And by the way, the overall rule of thumb is that for most companies, about 75 to 80% of all contacts are based on the top 10 or so issue types. But to analyze each of those issues or each of those processes or experiences and try to determine what is exactly the right scenario and the right experience for a customer who's trying to resolve this one issue. So for example, if a person is just looking for the credit union's routing number, that could so easily be handled by a bot. You simply put in your question on the screen, what's your routing number, and the answer pops up instantly. But a bot would be completely inappropriate for any kind of issue or situation that requires diagnosis or iteration, or where the customer doesn't know what the full range of their options is, or where they just need that human reassurance that they're doing everything correctly or that the credit union is doing everything right on their behalf. So it really comes down to analyzing why are customers contacting you and then trying to curate the exact right experience for a customer who's having that exact issue right now. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. That's great. So uh, let's, let's see if we can tie this a little bit uh, into the DNA of the company and, and, and particularly the back office, as you know, active ops works with, big financial services companies like you guys do. Uh, but we're more in the back office. We're not in the call center. We're helping workforce optimization occur in the back office. People that are adjudicating claims or, or loan servicing in the background, not necessarily on the phone or in the contact centers. So do you see a connection or a correlation between good back office and good exper experience on the front office? Sure. But it really comes down to your definition of what is good back office. And when it comes to the customer experience, Everyone who's involved in back office functionality should be asking themselves, is what we're doing positioning our frontline people for greater success in their interactions with customers? One of the things that we learned in a follow-on study to the effortless experience is that there's an absolute correlation between the degree to which frontline employees, contact center employees, feel like they're being positioned for success and the amount of effort that the customer experiences, and then the overall quality of that experience. So anybody who's a leader in a back office function ought to be asking themselves, is what we're doing making it easier or harder for our frontline people to succeed in their interactions with our customers? Excellent. So, but if we if we think about digital experience, one would think that you're talking to less frontline people. So, it, a bit of a sensitive and maybe awkward question is: if a if a company gets the digital experience right or the effortless experience right, does that eliminate need for call center agents? 
Yeah, that's the number one myth. That's the misnomer. Because when you say digital, it almost always implies no human contact. But the thing that's unique about what we're describing in our new book, the DCS platform, compared to just generic digital customer service, is that as many things as can be automated should be. Self-service ought to be made available to customers for all of the simplest and most common issues. But there always has to be an opportunity to speak to a live human being when that's the preference of the customer. But that live contact does not need to happen on the phone. It should happen right on the customer's own screen. So if you have a need as a customer to talk to somebody, either to explain something that you're not familiar with or to reassure you that everything's being handled the way you'd expect, that live human contact should happen right on my own screen. Because by the way, that's where the interaction started. Forrester research just this year indicates that 84% of customers now initiate any contact with a company through either their website or their mobile app. If that's where the customer chose to start, that's where the whole interaction should take place, even if there's a need for a live interaction. So when we say digital, at some level, that means automation and self-service. But at another level, it means I, as the customer, can bring a human being into my digital interaction anytime I choose, but that human being speaks to me and appears on my own screen. There you go. Okay. Now, when you click that even one step further in the DCS platform that we describe in the book, there's also an opportunity for co-browsing for the customer to press a button. And now the agent or the customer service rep can see exactly what the customer is looking at on their own screen. Just, of course, the company's own website or mobile app, not anything else that's in your browser window. And when the agent and the customer are looking at the same thing at the same time, that changes everything about the interaction. And particularly, it changes the perception of effort. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's, that's very true. I hadn't thought about that. That, that. that view into the problem, so to speak, is, is common now. Yeah, very good. So, um, so obviously the pandemic changed work habits. Uh, there's, you know, everybody went to work from home. Now everybody's figuring out what the hybrid workforce will look like. Some people will be in office, some won't. Maybe it changes day to day. Obviously, workforce optimization and our tools help you balance that. But what, where do you see that playing into this whole digital customer service uh, challenge? Everything that we're talking about here in this conversation and in the new book is entirely achievable by an agent who's working out of a home office. So for organizations that feel like they need to have some live presence some of the time, that absolutely makes sense. But for a completely uh, disassociated workforce or a complete work from home environment, everything that we're talking about works perfectly well. So it does feel like when you ask people, would you rather come to the office every single day or never come to the office at all? Almost everybody tends to agree it'd be nice to have a mix. It would yeah. be nice to be able to come in some of the time, but not have to come in all of the time. Yeah. And to the extent that so many companies bef just before the pandemic were very trepidatious about a work from home environment, virtually everyone recognizes it's not only possible, but in some cases it's even better. Yeah. But the best of both worlds is probably ultimately the solution. Yeah, exactly. So what, what would you say about the managers who are typically running call centers uh, and, and or contact centers or whatever we, we will evolve to call them over time? Um, what about that layer, the, you know, that operations management layer? Do you see uh, they're not going to be left out? They're still going to have eyes and ears to be able to manage the, the workflow, et cetera? The best thing about customer service is that it all happens in real time and everything's measurable. You know, the exact result of any interaction is all available for immediate or later dissection and scrutiny. Within the DCS platform, managers and supervisors can interject into the midst of an interaction that a rep is having with a customer, either in a way that's obvious to the customer or in a way that's obvious only to the agent. So you can stay as hands-on as you need to be, or at least make yourself available if any of your frontline people needs your assistance in the moment, in live fire with a customer. Yeah. So it doesn't matter whether the supervisor is sitting in an office down the hall or lives 
you know, an entire continent away. Everything still happens on the agent's screen. And of course, the customer experience should all happen on the customer's screen. So, you know, geographic proximity is neither a necessity nor a limitation anymore. Yeah, excellent. Excellent. Well, as we head into the end of the year and the holiday season, I'm sure a lot of people will be interacting with different uh, customer service organizations, whether it's to buy presents or ship presents, or maybe to resolve some financial things like contributing to IRAs, 401ks, or HSAs at the end of the year. So there's a lot of interactions that occur through this busy season. So maybe uh, we start by, I mentioned the new book, you've mentioned it, maybe we can give a little pitch for, for those looking for stocking stuffers. Yeah. If this is something that's interesting to you, seeing the evolution of customer service, that's what this book is really all about. In fact, it's a blend of two primary considerations. One is technology, and that's obvious because we're talking about digital customer service, but the other is psychology, thinking a little bit more about what is happening inside a customer's mind. First of all, when they have an issue, and then as they're contacting your company to try to get that issue resolved. And so in the book, we describe how the evolution of both technology and psychology have now converged to create this solution in which customers can resolve the vast number of issues on their own, but always have the opportunity and the access to a live person without having to stop, stop the whole digital interaction that they were in the midst of and start all over again by making a phone call. That's the real issue. That's the highest cause of effort in a customer interaction is when they go far down the road of trying to resolve an issue online, only to then realize I got to stop all that, find a phone number, go through that whole process all over again of re-authenticating myself and re-describing my issue. That's high effort. But if a customer needs live help, if they could press one button and then that live help occurs in the context of their own situation, of their own um, journey, then it completely changes the way the experience feels. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Very good, very good. And that book's available today. It's open. It's on Amazon, I'm sure, or other sources. Amazon, Barnes and Noble. Or uh, at your local used bookstore. (laughs) (laughs) Well, now, if somebody wanted to pick up a conversation with you, Rick, where would they, what's the best way to contact you and get in touch to to take these concepts further? Yeah, the easiest way is always LinkedIn. So it's just my name, Rick DeLisi, D-E-L-I-S-I. I'm on LinkedIn. Uh, my email address is rick.delisi at glia.com, G-L-I-A. And for anybody who wants to continue this conversation, we're always open to that. Love to get your reaction to anybody who's had a chance to read the book. And if this sounds like something that, that you'd like to continue, we're always game to have that conversation. Well, thank you so much, Rick, for joining us today. It was an enjoyable conversation, and it's, it's fascinating to see the, the convergence of the digital experience uh, occurring in, in all, across all businesses. So thank you so much for joining us. And, and thank you, everybody, that tuned in today or watched it on, on, on AOTV or your favorite podcast channel. We appreciate you being here. As always, stay tuned for the next episode of AO On Air. In the meantime, if you'd like to learn more about ActiveOps, please join us at ActiveOps.com, where you can find eBooks and videos, white papers, et cetera, on all of our solutions. Thank you so much and have a great day and we look forward to seeing you in the new year. At ActiveOps, we call it Management Process Automation or MPA. MPA helps managers make better decisions by providing a consistent, easy to understand view of capacity and productivity. MPA does the hard work of consolidating information, forecasting and planning, and even gives you visibility of skills and capabilities across your enterprise. Your managers can make decisions based on a complete picture of their operations and then get back to leading. As work progresses, MPA helps managers spot problems early and deal with them proactively, celebrate successes properly and match resource to workload in real time. By making managers more effective, MPA reduces operational costs. Best of all, the right MPA tools make it possible to deliver all these benefits across global enterprises with thousands of employees. Solutions like Workwear Plus from ActiveOps. Workwear Plus builds on our 20 years of experience supporting service operations to give you a 360 degree view of your operations, helping you turn operations management from a guessing game into a game changing source of efficiency and value. Employees are empowered to manage their days and weeks, feeling accomplished, confident, and able to balance work and personal life. 
Wherever your organisation or customers live and work, ActiveOps is ready to help you deliver world-class service and employee engagement to help your company thrive. ActiveOps. See further. No more. Move faster.